our society is one that believes in living life to its fullest. Right? You uh, try to do as much and make as much of your life as you can. You see this in a variety of attitudes. Um, you know, this is expressed in a variety of ways, ranging from you know, the, probably the most juvenile with YOLO, right? You only live once, so do everything you can. You only live once to, uh, uh, you know, being a master of industry, right? To uh, uh, producing the most, making the most money you can, <clears throat> um, being able to have the most possessions, or, um, you know, being able to make the greatest discoveries, you know, things like this. Uh, we believe in individual liberty and freedom in order to achieve such things. We believe that, uh, you know, the purpose of your life is to do as much as you can. Now, uh, this is kind of a stark contrast to Epicurus. Epicurus uh, would say, you know, if you try to do as much as you possibly can, if you try to you know, take everything, have everything, you're going to lead a life of misery. In these two excerpts that we have, these two pieces of Epicurus that we have, the letter to Meniceus and the principal doctrines, uh, Epicurus is asking the question of what it means to lead a good life. What's a life that's worth living? Now his answer is uh, perhaps, yeah, again, maybe a little bit surprising, but in, in, in contrast to uh, what, we, what I said earlier, a life that's worth living, the good life, is uh, a life of pleasure. Now, you, you, you might have immediate images of, <laughs> you know, partying all night and uh, the best foods. And, you know, you, you even have this term Epicurean to, you know, kind of mean, the, you know, the, the most sensually tasteful foods or something like that. But, you know, that's not what Epicurus had in mind. When he was talking about pleasure, uh, he was talking about the tranquility of the mind. And the tranquility of the mind doesn't deal very much with you know, all of this, right? uh, it doesn't deal with sensuality. It deals primarily with contemplation. At the beginning of this letter to Meniceus, uh, Epicurus says a couple of things that you might think, um, you know, maybe think are a little strange. And that's actually kind of the point. You know, the first thing he tells Meniceus is not to fear death. I'll get to that in just a second. The second thing uh, is he tells Meniceus to believe in a particular, uh, particular god. Now, uh, you know, Epicurus is not a Christian. He's not a Hebrew. He's a Greek. Now, the point of what he's saying uh, is to, you know, he's telling Meniceus to believe in a god that's alive and living a life of blessedness, that sort of thing. Now, um, you might have some preconceptions of what uh, Epicurus means by blessedness. I, they're probably mistaken. <laughs> I mean, given a lot of what he describes as a life of happiness, um, blessedness is probably not something that uh, you have a whole lot of experience with. So, uh, but again, we'll get to what uh, Epicurus means by, you know, this happy life later on in the video. In the meantime, really, you know, the whole point that Meniceus has, excuse me, Epicurus has here in telling Meniceus to believe in this particular kind of God is to contrast uh, what Epicurus thinks is this good life to what, you know, the culture of the time thought was a good life. So, you know, we might think that Epicurus has, you know, Dionysus in particular, that's his, his, his real intended target as, his, you know, he's telling Meniceus not to believe what the uh, Dionysians had to say about a blessed life. But it's not just Dionysus. You know, Dionysus was this uh, Greek god of, you know, frivolity and fun and, you know, kind of madness and sensuality, basically. You know, we, uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? That's Dionysus. <laughs> um, but Epicurus doesn't have just Dionysus in mind. Right? Uh, he would tell the worshippers of uh, Hephaestus, right? The god of, you know, metalworking, blacksmith. You know, we, we might today think of like industry or craftsmanship, right? Uh, you might tell those worshippers, you know, let go of this need to perfect 
being a, you know, the best blacksmith or perfecting trade. Uh, he, he might tell, what, the worshippers of Ares, right, who, you know, basically soldiers. Uh, you might tell his worshippers to very stop thinking that strife and competition is going to perfect you. That's not the blessed life. That's not the happy life. So the point that uh, Epicurus has here in telling De Menisius not, you know, in telling Men Menisius to worship this, uh, this immortal blessed God is not because he's necessarily trying to convert Menisius to any particular religious belief. He's not. In fact, he says that everybody's got it wrong. They don't know what a blessed life is. They don't know what you know, this, this God is like. And he's not trying to get Menisius to subscribe to any particular religious belief. You know, the rest of the letter, and you've got the principal doctrines, they don't look towards what, they don't look towards any kind of purported revealed text. They don't look towards any particular religious belief. Rather, the point that, uh, Epicurus has here in, in the beginning of this letter to Menisius is to say everything you've been taught about what is good or, and then what is bad is wrong. I mean, death is not bad and what these different religious cults have had to say about what is good is not good. So the beginning of this letter is really just to say clear your mind of all these beliefs. So for Epicurus, desires come in a variety of kinds, <laughs> but starting with natural desires versus groundless desires. Now, natural desires are ones that would actually produce at least some kind of pleasure, some kind of happiness if you fulfilled them. Groundless desires are ones that are, you know, he says are based on just useless opinion. I mean, these are, you know, desires where if you fulfill them, they don't really produce happiness. They don't really do anything. Um, you know, they're being... You know, maybe they produce more misery, or maybe maybe it's just not relevant to decisions about pleasure or happiness because it doesn't really do much. Now, to to illustrate the groundless desire, he uh, talks about death, and he even starts starts off talking about death with the letter to Menisius. And you know, he says, "You know, death is nothing to us." What's that supposed to mean? Well, I think what he's getting at is something like this: you know, this desire to avoid death. The uh, desire to live forever, right? Maybe that's another way to say it. But, you know, well, but actually, just primarily this desire to avoid death. That's a groundless desire. It, it won't have an impact on pleasure or pain, right? It, is, is what he's saying. Now, you know, to understand what he means, is, well, you have to understand what uh, Epicurus says about death. He says, you know, death is, you know, for Epicurus, is ceasing to exist. Right? It's nothingness. It's an absence of any kind of awareness or sentience, life, uh, absence of sensation. You can't experience anything with death. And the reason why you can't experience anything with death is because you cease to be. All right. Yeah, you, you might be surprised about this, given what he has to say about um, believing in, the, in this immortal and blessed God. Uh, but again, he's, he's not a Hebrew. He's not a Christian. He's, he, he, you know, he's something else. Uh, he, he doesn't think that there is an afterlife. He thinks this, at least you know, from this reading, uh, he thinks that this is it. Well, uh, you know, so he starts off with this claim that death is nothingness. Well, if, if death is an so we have that. Well, let's suppose, let's say, well, if death is an evil, right? Well, then for Epicurus, if death is an evil, then death uh, is a pain. Right? It has some kind of pain involved. Uh, and if death is a pain, then you have sensation or experiences with death. But you don't, right? This is false. We just got finished saying that. Uh, death is, a, is ceasing, a cessation of any kind of experience. So it's false that death is an evil. Well, you know, we might think, well, then gosh, you know, everybody just rushed to death, right? So you know, he's, oh, that's scary. Uh, you know, Epicurus is quick to, to stop any kind of... Uh, notion that way is going to say, look, you know, this doesn't mean that you know, the, the foolish man thinks you should just you know, go after death. No, that's, that's stupid too, he says. That's groundless. Right. Now, um, you know, take it the other way. You know, suppose death is a good. Well, if death is a good, then death is pleasurable for Epicurus. 
And if death is pleasurable, then death has some kind of sensation, some kind of experience or awareness. But how he started out, there is no, uh, there is no experience with death. Right? You cease to exist. So it's false that death is is a good too. So you know it's false that death is a good, and it's false that death is an evil. If it's false that it you know it's, you know either one of these, well, then death is nothing. It makes no impact on how you should live your life. Uh, you can try, you know. So this desire to avoid death doesn't do any good because. Well, you know, first of all, you can't. <laughs> You're going to die. Um, but secondly, uh, um, even if you die, right, there's no happiness or pleasure to be fulfilled in that desire not being fulfilled. There's, there's just no, nothing to it. So uh, this desire to avoid death is groundless for Epicurus. I mean, for starters, you can't. And secondly, um, it's, you know, death isn't bad. And death isn't good. Death, for Epicurus, is nothing. Alright, so we talked about uh, natural desires versus uh, groundless desires, or these, you know, kind of useless desires. <laughs> Uh, now, natural desires are ones that, if they're fulfilled, then they'll produce happiness, right? They'll produce, you know, pleasures. Now, you, you know, you might think, well, that, that's all there is to it. You know, Epicurus is done. But, you know, he has a further point to be made. Right? Uh, natural desires come in two kinds, all right? So, uh, na so, what makes a natural desire is if it's fulfilled, then it produces happiness. But what if it's not fulfilled? And... There are two kinds. If it's not fulfilled and it does not produce unhappiness, then it's just a natural desire. It's merely a natural desire. Um, but if a desire is unfulfilled and it produces unhappiness, then that's a necessary natural desire. So what does this mean? Well, okay, uh, if you don't have water, <laughs> if you don't have water, uh, that produces a lot of unhappiness. It really does. You uh, suffer and uh, you die uh, within two, I think it's two or three days, right? If you don't have water, you die in two or three days. All right, so that, well, that's, that definitely produces unhappiness, that suffering of thirst, that, that, that produces unhappiness. Uh, but what about caviar? If you don't have caviar, then, uh, you know, you're fine, basically. I mean, most everybody watching the video has never had caviar and never will. And uh, you lead otherwise happy lives, right? So you don't need caviar. Now, now eating caviar might produce happiness. You know, it's supposed to be tasty, right? You might enjoy it. It's food, it's sustenance, so you, so you eat it. But if you don't have caviar, well, you're going to be fine. I mean, you should still eat something. You know, you should have uh, uh, at least some kind of food, you know, vegetables, grains, this sort of thing. <laughs> you need those sorts of things. Uh, but if you don't have caviar, well, that's okay. So caviar is a natural desire, but it's not necessary. Water is a natural desire, and it's necessary. Now, this distinction between uh, the merely natural and the necessary natural desires is what's going to lead Epicurus to make claims about, uh, you, you know, having kind of a, a simple life. You know, we contrast this with... What we do in, a, in in our culture, we think that our culture, you know, we try to have as much as you as we can. You know, our culture, you say, yeah, you, you ought to go after the caviar. <laughs> you ought to go get the caviar. Uh, but Epicurus is going to say, well, it's probably not such a good idea. All right, uh, you ought to try to lead a simple life, and the reason is, is because uh, uh, you know you need the necessary desires to be fulfilled, but that's it, and that doesn't require a whole lot of effort. So he has a whole argument for that. Let's take a look at that next. Well, Epicurus has given us an argument in this letter to Menaces, Menaces to uh, basically 
I mean, the conclusion is, is, is you know, to live as, with as little as you can. Right? With as little as you can. Now, this, this might seem kind of strange to us, but you know, he has his reasons for it. Now, remember that you know, from the beginning of this letter, he said that you know, this, the purpose of life is this pursuit and, uh, of pleasure, is achieving is much of this pleasure. And again, how he defines pleasure, I mean, the, the main kind of pleasure is this absence of pain. Uh, and he also notes that some uh, pleasures are followed by pain, <laughs> and some pains are followed by pleasure. So, um, you know, um, eating a whole bunch of fried food. Well, that, it's really pleasurable. It tastes great. But it's followed by pains, right? You, you, you're overweight. Your blood pressure rises. Um, you, you, you aren't as active. You don't have as much energy. It's not nutritious for you. Things like that. So if it's something like that, you, you probably shouldn't do it. Because, you know, in the end, it's not good for you. The same way, you know, kind of, kind of a, on the other hand, you know, we have that some pains are followed by pleasure. So exercise. Exercise is an exertion, right? It, it's hard. It, you know, I'm walking around here all day. And, you know, it's it hard on my legs. And uh, I'm out in the sun. The sun hurts my eyes. Things like that. That's why I wear sunglasses, because it hurts my eyes. I'm in the shade right now, so it's not so bad. But, uh... uh you know, there, there is a pleasure that's, that follows from it, namely some good health, so I have increased energy. And, and, you know, I'm also enjoying my time out here. You know, this park is really, really lovely. So, you know, with, you know, with, this, with these two things together, that, you know, you know, our purpose in life is to pursue pleasure, and, you know, some pleasures are followed by pain, and some pains are followed by pleasure. Well, then, you know, we have to do this calculus. We have to sit here and figure out, well, what course of action is going to result in the most pleasure? And so we we got to sit sit down and figure that out. Okay. Well, uh, so we you know, we have to pursue that course of action that results in the great in, in, in the most pleasure in our lives. All right. Well, some pleasures, Epicurus notes. Uh, excuse me. Some pains, Epicurus notes. Some pains are caused by an absence of pleasure. So if you've ever Smoked, right? <laughs> uh, if you ever smoke cigarettes, oh, that feels really good. But then you you, know, you stop, and it's followed followed by withdrawal, and that kind of stings. Well, yeah, you know, there's examples like that with, you know, addiction, right? Uh, but not just that. You know, think about, you know, the best dessert I ever had was in a four star restaurant in New Orleans. It was fantastic dessert. It was it was this dark chocolate cake. Uh, and you know, it wasn't big, but man, was it ever good. Um, but I'm never going to have that again, you know, unless maybe I go to New Orleans. But, you know, I don't often go to uh, four-star uh, restaurants, five-star restaurants or hotels. I mean, it's really expensive. But, you know, I've had that fantastic dessert. And, you know, it's not that other desserts aren't good. They are good. But that was the best one I've ever had. And... I, you know, I, I haven't had that again. Um, so that's... Actually, that's not true. Steakhouse here in San Antonio, a four or five star steakhouse here in San Antonio. I was with uh, my now wife and, and, and her son and we were celebrating. Had this chocolate lava cake. That was the best dessert I ever had. It's fantastic. It was amazing. But, you know, point being, you know, I haven't had that again. And you know, Other desserts are good, but they're, they're just not as good as that one. Well, that, that's an absence of pleasure. And yeah, you know, I, I really kind of would like to have that dessert every night. You know, supposing I didn't gain weight or whatever, right? I would really like to have that kind of dessert. Well, on top of this, right, that pleasure, some of these absences of pleasures are absences of unnecessary pleasures. Uh, I didn't need that chocolate cake. I didn't. I liked it, but I didn't need it. You know, contrast this to, to water. If I don't have water, I get really thirsty. That's a pain caused by an absence of, of a pleasure. But, uh, uh, you know, I needed that water, right? I still need that water, so you know, I'm going to get it again. This, this is a necessary pleasure. Well, some of these pleasure, some of these pains caused by an absence of pleasure are also uh, pleasures... The absences of pleasures from unnecessary desires. 
I don't need that chocolate cake. Well, if the point is to you know, you know, follow that course of action that uh, has the greatest amount of pleasure, and some of these some of these pains are caused by absences of pleasure, and some of these pleasures are unnecessary, then I ought to choose that course of action that result that that that, that involves only necessary desires. Because all these other ones, all these other unnecessary desires, I, I won't necessarily be able to fulfill them again, and you know, then I'll be gone, right? I won't have them anymore. Sorry, then those things will be gone, and won't be able to have them anymore, and that's going to cause pain. So instead, Epicurus is going to say, instead of subjecting yourself to that, pursue only the necessary desires. Right? You don't need those other ones. You don't, especially if you've never experienced it. If I never had that chocolate cake, I would never miss it. I would never miss it. Uh, if I've never had, you know, a hundred-year-old wine, I'll never miss it. Well, if I never miss it, then I won't experience that pain, that pain of missing it. So Epicurus thinks the decision is pretty simple here: pursue only those desires that are necessary, the natural necessary desires. Don't pursue the ones that are just merely natural, the unnecessary natural desires. And you'll have a happy life. And you'll use as little as possible. And you know, on top of that, maybe you'll like do as little as possible. Epicurus tells us we ought to lead a life free from these unnecessary desires. You know, they, they can result in happiness, but, it, you know, if you don't have them, you're going to be miserable. What's left? Well, they're, they're the necessary desires. Necessary needs. What do you need for him? You need, well, the, the, these desires that... Um, allow you to live. Food, water, exercise, medicine, these shelter, clothing. These are necessary to live. Now you don't have to have a big house for Epicurus. You know, you have enough of a place to live in to be comfortable. And you shouldn't try to ever live in a big house because, well, you'll miss it in case it's ever gone. You need clothes, but you don't need the high-end fashion clothes. You don't need to look all that wonderful. You know, just maybe uh, you know if you're worried about the appearance at all, right? If if it covers your body and protects you, okay. But if you're worried about the appearance at all, go for something simple. Don't go for high fashion. So that's the first kind of desire: the desires, the needs that uh, you need to live. Second, uh, you know. Those things that avoid what he calls bodily unpleasantness. Um, kind of wrapped up in the first one, you know, in order to live, but, um, you, you know, these sunglasses, right? The sunlight, at least the direct sunlight, really hurts my eyes. That's a bodily unpleasantness. So, I, you know, wear sunglasses. Now, the hat I had on earlier, the hat um, avoids, you know, sunburn and skin cancer, other things like that. Uh, those sorts of things avoid bodily unpleasantness. And the last one are those desires for happiness. Well, you know, at this point, we're, our interest has really peaked. Like, well, what do we need for happiness? That seems to be the most important thing. Surely we need a lot. Epicurus says, no, you don't need a lot. You need friends. You need to be able to talk with people. He even has, in, in the... Uh, you know, foundational principles. He has more than a few of them devoted to the idea of justice, and justice is this mutually beneficial relationship. So that's going to be that's going to be a need too. You need friends. Besides friends, you need to have at least some belief in the existence of this immortal God, this blessed God. Now, if you don't like that, right? If, if you're you know, uh, 
not comfortable with the idea of a god. I don't think he's going to mind too much, uh, other than you know he thinks that one is necessary for the existence of everything. But you know, maybe, maybe you don't. Okay, just don't subscribe to what everybody else thinks. Now, what he's talking about there again, you know, pretty much all he knew were the Greek gods. You know, he doesn't think. You know, he, he, he's, he thinks you shouldn't believe in these capricious, very human-like gods, ones that are concerned with position, power, and all these other unnecessary <laughs> desires that, that he just got finished talking about. All those are unnecessary. This, uh, you know, divinity for uh, Epicurus, this one that's uh, blessed, is uh, one that doesn't need anything else for its existence. One that um, is not dependent on anything. One that probably just contemplates existence. All right? that, that's what this uh, God does. And he thinks you should do that too. He thinks you, for happiness, you need friends and you need to contemplate the world around you. You need to understand its patterns, its movements, the reality of it all. And the reason, you know, not only so you better understand how to fulfill your needs to live and to avoid bodily unpleasantness, but, you know, this is really neat. All this reality around you, you don't have to make it. It's not like the movies, right? The movies, we have to make that reality. We have to devote lots of resources to uh, creating the movies. Epicurus says, why? Come out and just enjoy it. You don't need all that. So for happiness, for the good life, for the pleasurable life, according to Epicurus, you need clothing, food, shelter, medicine maybe, friends, and to contemplate. Contemplate this wondrous reality all around you.